Euro 7 is officially coming. The main regulation has now been published, the content agreed and the dates finalised. In this video I'm going to give a high level overview of what Euro 7 is and what it covers. As you may have seen in the media, the Euro 7 package is quite a bit tamer to what was initially proposed in 2022. There's still lots of new and interesting bits. Euro 7 replaces both Euro 6 for cars and vans and Euro 6 with a Roman numeral for trucks and buses. If it is somehow of interest, the Euro 7 regulation is called 2024-1257. Rolls off the tongue. In this video, I will just focus on cars and vans, which in regulatory speak is known as M1 for passenger cars and N1 for vans below three and a half tons. Perhaps I'll do another video on heavy duty vehicles later. There's a common misconception that the Euro regulations only apply to cars with petrol and diesel engines, including hybrids, but they do also apply to electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles, and in fact, any vehicle running on any fuel being biofuels, hydrogen, or future fuels like e-fuels. Of course, some aspects don't apply to certain powertrain types. For example, the tailpipe emission bits don't apply to electric vehicles. So what does Euro 7 actually regulate? Well, it's no surprise that it regulates tailpipe emissions as per all Euro stages. There are also evaporative emissions for petrol cars that I'll talk more on later. But new under Euro 7 is the regulation of emissions from both brakes and tires applying to all vehicles, regardless of powertrain, and battery durability requirements, which applies to battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. I'll go into each area in this video. So let's start with tailpipe emissions, because after all, that's been the main focus of the Euro regulations in the past. Starting with M1 cars, the pollutants regulated and the emission limits are actually the same as Euro 6, including having slightly different values for petrol and diesel cars, depending on the emission, which is the same as Euro 6. If you want the numbers in detail, then feel free to pause the video, but all you need to know really is that this is the same as Euro 6. Meanwhile, for vans, N1 is actually split into three classes based on their running mass. So class one, class two, and class three. Class one is the same as passenger cars, but class two and class three do have slightly higher limits. But again, this is all the same as Euro 6 in terms of what the emissions are and the limits. But before we move on, although the limits are the same as Euro 6, one thing to mention is that the particulate number limit now applies to particulates of 10 nanometers or bigger instead of 23 nanometers. What that means is that more particulates are counted. So to meet the same limit, you essentially need to emit less particulates. So that element is actually stricter. What is new for Euro 7 is onboard monitoring. And this is quite a big one. So you might be aware that when emissions are tested to check compliance at type approval, they are done in a laboratory where the car is driven along the WLTP cycle trace in a controlled environment and the emissions are measured accurately using an array of test equipment. CO2, fuel consumption and electric range values are conducted in the same way. However, at Euro 6C, real world driving emission testing was also introduced. This is where the emission measuring equipment is fitted to the car and the car is then driven along a mix of urban, rural and motorway roads. Those emissions are compared against the limits set for the laboratory tests, and this is all done to ensure vehicles retain strict emission control when used in the typical real world conditions. I won't mention what happened in the industry to drive all of that to be introduced. But what is new is onboard monitoring or OBM, which is real time onboard measuring of NOx and particulate matter emissions. Instead of a big box on the back, the vehicle is expected to have the required sensors and modeling to determine those emissions with the vehicle in everyday use. The idea is, if the emissions measures are excessive, the driver is notified, and if they ignore that warning, the vehicle eventually stops working until they get the car investigated. This is beyond what cars do today with onboard diagnostics or OBD. The data is also shared randomly and anonymously with the authorities over the air to help identify which models are exceeding limits frequently, and they may wish to investigate further. Now evaporative emissions, which is an aspect already regulated under Euro 6. So under Euro 6, an evaporative emission test is mandatory, but is only done for petrol cars and vans due to the volatility of petrol. Essentially, a vehicle is put in an enclosed test facility for 48 hours, and the hydrocarbons released from the vehicle are measured. Under Euro 6, that limit was 2 grams. Under Euro 7, that will go down to 1.5 grams, and still only applies to petrol vehicles. 
Not all those hydrocarbons are from petrol evaporating and escaping. Tires, interior plastics and adhesives may also be sources of hydrocarbons. The regulation of brake emissions is also a new part of Euro 7. When brakes are used, the friction surfaces wear and this releases particulate emissions. There will be limits for vehicles for both particulate matter and particulate number, but the actual measurement will be done at a brake assembly level. If you're super keen, UN Global Technical Regulation 24 outlines how this will be done. The level of electrification the vehicle has then applies a factor to represent how much regenerative braking may be used and hence how much less the brakes may be used in the real world. The limits do change over time, but until 2030, the limits are as follows. So for all passenger cars and class one and class two vans, the limit is seven milligrams per kilometer up until 2030. However, for battery electric vehicles, the limit is actually three. And then again, for class three vans, the limit is 11. But if it is a pure electric van, then the limit is five milligrams per kilometer. So although the limits are lower for battery electric vehicles, which does seem a bit odd, the fact that they have so much regenerative braking is a massive factor on the measure result. As for brakes, tyres are also brought into Euro 7 as another source of emissions. Now as tyres wear, particles of the tyre compound break away. There's a lot of missing detail on how tyre emissions will be regulated and what the limits may be. What we do know, there is the intention to regulate particulate mass and particulate number, and it will be more for the tyre industry to develop tyres that are Euro 7 approved. One new aspect that is very much for vehicle manufacturers is battery durability. This is essentially to try and set limits on battery degradation for battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids, but also to give structure and commonality to the state of health assessment and transparency to vehicle users. Now, over time, batteries can degrade. There are many variables that can affect this, like the chemistry of the battery, how the battery is cooled and managed, and how it is charged amongst many other things. Under Euro 7, there are minimum limits at age and mileage intervals, not only that, the state of health must be visible to the vehicle user by the display or some sort of connected device at any time. Now, one more thing to slip in, the environmental vehicle passport. This is essentially a set of environmental information that can be easily found in the vehicle and off the vehicle, although how that is done is still not clear. The passport includes information like the emission limits, battery state of health limits, and CO2 range and fuel efficiency of the car. It's sort of a more accessible extract of the current certificate of conformity which you currently get when you buy a new car. So now you want to know when this is coming. The introductory dates for cars and vans are split. So for new type approved vehicles, which in simple terms generally means a new model brought to market, those vehicles will need to comply with Euro 7 from the 29th of November, 2026. Meanwhile, 12 months later, those requirements apply to all new registered vehicles. So essentially all new vehicles sold. There is a separate introduction date for small volume manufacturers of the 30th of July 2030, which gives them a bit more time to respond to the requirements. For tyres, they have their own time frame based on the tyre category. Tyres are split into C1, C2 and C3. Generally, C1 is for cars and light vans, C2 for heavier vans and C3 for big commercial vehicles. That's oversimplified, but it gives you an idea. Regarding dates, there is a three-phase intro. Initially, new type approved tyres will need to comply from 2028 for C1 and two-year steps for the other tyre categories. Next up is for new tyres placed on the market, and this is when vehicle manufacturers need to make sure that the new registered vehicles they offer have Euro 7 tyres fitted. And then from 2032 for C1, all tyres available on the market, regardless of what car you're going to fit them to, need to be Euro 7 approved. So even if you're hanging on to your old car, you can't hide from Euro 7. So what now? Well, not quite. The industry has been working on Euro 7 for years, but now they have a bit more clarity around dates and requirements, whether it will mean new technologies, new testing and new challenges. But the published Euro 7 regulation is the main act. It sort of sets out what should be regulated and some high level requirements. But there will also be secondary regulations known as implementing rules. These will have all the detail on how you actually meet the requirements. These aren't published yet and they may not be grouped as I have shown here, but it gives you an idea that there will be much more detailed regulation behind what is published and that it isn't all a done deal yet. So that's a quick whittle stop tour of Euro 7. There's so much more detail to it, an extra bit, some we know, some we don't know and so much more to come with the implementing rules, but this should give you a flavor of what to expect 
at a very simplified level. Let me know what you think and if you want me to do a version of this video for heavy duty vehicles too.